Hello everybody, so I am Dr. Brian O'Neill and uh, I'm your professor for this Biology 214 Ecology and Society. So one thing I want to make sure that everybody knows is that if anybody is ever coming up with any type of problems in this course, please contact me as soon as possible. So email, phone call, whatever. Um, we want to try to get your problems fixed as soon as possible and this is extremely important in such a short um, class, you know, this class is only going to be uh, three weeks, so we really need to um, fix problems as quickly as possible. So please uh, email me, give me a call, whatever. All right, so one thing how I want to do this course is have everything being asynchronous, meaning anybody can basically do anything at any time. Um, uh, basically, there's really only four for one main due date and three small main due dates beyond that, there's going to be 13 units in this course. And all the materials are going to be due basically June 13th at 11.59 p.m. Okay. Now you'll have three other assignments that will be due um, May 29th, June 5th, and June 12th. And those will be also at 11.59. But realistically, you know, there's like 600 some points in this course, and all of those 600 points will be due at this June 13th at 11:59. So remember this date, write it down, keep it in mind. Um, these this pond water mini habitat thing that's only going to be um, 30 points out of the whole course. So. Um, here, let's get rid of me. You don't really need to see me anymore. Hey. Oop, wrong one. There we go. <laughs> so, um, super important for this course is that you're going to need to pace yourself. Okay, so uh, I like to go through this every time I teach an online course because I think it's um, super important. So, generally what we say, and we, we meaning this is, you know, education people, that if you have one hour in class, that's two hours outside of, you should spend two hours outside of class preparing, studying, doing, working on homework, doing assignments, all types of that kind of thing. So in a normal semester, you have 16 weeks. Uh, this is a three credit class. So you would expect um, three hours of class per week, which means 48 total class hours. Multiply that times two to get 96 hour out, outside of class hours. So this is that studying and doing assignments. So add 96 to 48 and you get 144 total hours you should spend on this course. Now, 144 hours over 16 weeks is not that big of a deal. 144 hours over 19 days means seven and a half hours per day. Now that is to do well in this course. So I just want to make sure that um, you know everybody knows that I expect this course. You might think there's a whole lot of stuff in this course, but this again, this is taking a whole 16-week course and crunching it down into three minutes. So how is this generally set up? What you know, there, again, there's 13 units, and pretty much every unit has almost all the units have a discussion board where you're going to have to post something, uh, read a chapter in the book. There's some video lectures that I'll post on uh, YouTube. There'll all be links for that. But um, And then there's uh, this quiz will be over the book and the video lectures. Then I'm going to have you listen to a podcast. These podcasts will be from a variety of sources, Radio Lab and economics podcast maybe you're familiar with these podcasts but then there'll be a quiz over the podcast and then every other unit there'll be a 20 point assignment okay and so this mostly will be writing assignments you'll see that come up now uh, there'll be two exams 60 points each one after unit 5 one after unit 13 um, and how I'm setting this course up is that you the units have to be done in order, and all things must be completed in one unit before moving on to the next unit. So let's move on to a little bit to writing in this course. Um, 
what, you know, what I want to stress to you is that when there's going to be a lot of writing in this course, basically, there's going to be every other unit, two essays that you're going to have to write. They're, they're short. We'll get over get that in a second. But I really want to get you out of the idea of writing in like a stream of consciousness kind of thing. I really want um, you to be thinking about how you're writing. And I, the best way I think to do that is by following the old classic three kind of paragraph um, way of writing an essay. So you write an introductory paragraph, you have a body paragraph, and we're going to have somewhere around three arguments or examples or ideas or points that you're going to be talking about, and then you'll, you'll write a conclusion. Now, um, in the introductions of all your writing, um, you're going to want to have a thesis statement. So this is, you know, like the whole main point of why you're writing your, your essay. Maybe it's just one sent. It, it should be one sentence, right? Maybe there'll be. It could be a couple, depending on how you want to do it. But uh, generally, because we're going to be writing 200 word essays in this um, in this class, um, it's the introduction. It, it's really important to have a thesis statement of just one sentence to be very concise um, and very. Um, that might be the only thing in your introduction. Now, the important thing to know about um, a, a thesis statement is it kind of helps guide your writing. So if you can know where you're going to go in your writing before you, um, before you write, it makes the writing process much, much easier so that you'll know, that you know where you're going so you'll be able to write everything much easier. So this, um, once we get the introduction, you'll want to think about your arguments or, you know, your pieces of evidence that you'll use to uh, make your point. Um, so each argument can be distinct. They can be linked. It doesn't really matter how you do it. But um, because a 200 word essay is really is, is like less than half a page, you really need to be. Uh, really tight with your writing. It has to be concise. It can never be redundant, um, never vague. So what I would do is, you know, write, when you're writing your 200 word essay, write it out, see where you're at at the word count. Um, I think you're actually going to have a hard time cutting it down to 200 words. So uh, with the prompts that I give you for this course, it's going to be, um, you know, a lot to fit and it's going to have to be very dense writing. Um, so you're going to have to be eliminating a lot of fluff that are in um, a lot of what I see in undergraduate writing. So the conclusion, I think, is one of the most difficult things in, for this course, especially with just a 200-word essay. You, um, it, It's meant to wrap up your arguments, okay? It's meant to... Depending on how you write, it may connect what you saw, what you made in your arguments, um, or the, the arguments that you made. It might connect them a little better. Um, it might show a bigger picture. It kind of just depends on how you're writing it. But one thing I really want to be sure to uh, make a, a point of is that it should not just be like a summary, a recap of what you just wrote. It needs to add something to the essay. It might have new information, shed new light on what you just wrote about. Um, it, it always needs to add something new because otherwise um, there's no real point. It's only a 200-word essay, so it's not that long. Um, okay, so I want to talk about plagiarism in this course because I've had some difficulty with this in the past when I've caught this, taught this um, course. Um, I've had a decent amount of plagiarism uh, that students are doing um, and I just kind of want to go through it and um, so we can head off that problem uh, before, you know, before anything happens. Okay, so what is plagiarism, right? It's a misrepresentation of another's work as your own. And it may not be intentional, 
Sometimes it is, right? Uh, basically, you know, wherever you take it, whether you're copying pasting from an internet source, you might just be paraphrasing from an internet source. But you, um, anytime you take something, somebody else's words, somebody else's ideas, you need to give them credit for it. Now, um, how you can give them credit then is by two ways. The first is with internal citations. Okay, so this is copied and pasted from one of my uh, papers that I wrote, and um, I'm an aquatic biologist where I um, talk about things that live in uh, small ponds that dried up. Um, and what I'm doing here is, while these words are mine, I got the idea from this this guy, his name is Dudley Williams, and he wrote a paper in 2006, and that's where this idea comes from. These ideas in here come from this guy Erickson in another paper. Um, and what this is doing is it's a visual cue that tells you these ideas are not my own, but I am putting them together in maybe a new way and helps you, um, you know, if someone's reading this paper, they can be directed, oh, I wonder what that guy Williams said in 2006. I'm going to go look at that paper later on. So I expect internal citations in your work here. And all that all you need for that is an author and a year. However, every time you make an internal citation, then you're going to need an external citation. So this is basically your bibliography. So you'll write your 200 word essay, and then your references will not count in, as those 200 words. So these are, you know, examples of, of um, certain certain articles that I have in, in the paper that I was just just referencing earlier. So make sure that you have an external citation. Now, what do you cite? You don't really need to cite common knowledge, your own ideas, idioms or well-known phrases, right? Um, but any unique phrases, anytime you're talking about a quote, if you're paraphrasing something, summaries, ideas of someone else's, you're definitely need, going to need to um, need to cite them. So um, a lot of people ask me, well, I got found this information on the internet and I can't find an author. Um, first off, that's probably not a very reputable source that you shouldn't, you, you shouldn't use it. You should probably find another source to, to talk um, to reference. Uh, but if you're absolutely like really want to use that source, do the best you can. Fill in as much as you can. Uh, maybe that it will just have to be uh, if it, you did find it, find it on the web, um, just a website and the year that you um, reference that. As far as like format of in the bibliography, I don't really care if you use MLA, APA. Great. Um, you could just basically follow this kind of thing where you have, you know, the last name, the first and initial. So let's say it's me, O'Neill, B, year of 2016, title, you know, whatever the title of the article is, whatever it was published in, the volume and the page number. Um, the, 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 if you were to have that information, I'm not really concerned super much about you having these super great bibliographies, but I do want um, to be able to find that source um, easily. So how do we avoid academic misconduct? Well, the first thing is citations, right? Internal citations and external citations. If you're unsure whether you need a citation or not, well, just cite your source and you'll be good, and then that will um, be no problem. I will say that all assignments checked um, all assignments that you turn in in this course are checked in a, uh, a, a plagiarism like program that University of Wisconsin Whitewater um, looks in or subscribes to. Turn it in. I don't know if you're familiar with this or not, but basically it goes out and finds if you copied and pasted from other people's work or from the internet, and it works quite well. I will say that. So um, you'll see in the syllabus that um, I do closely follow Wisconsin Chapter 14, it's called. Um, so University of Wisconsin System Chapter 14, 
which is basically the academic misconduct uh, policies. Um, for this course, what I'm going to use is for the first offense, you'll have a zero on the assignment. Okay. Um, second offense of academic misconduct, I'm just going to lower your what your course grade by a letter grade, so 10%. Um, and third offense, you'll fail the course, possibly more severe penalties. Um, what I would say is this, I, I'm not trying to scare you here. I'm just trying to tell you that I've had problems with plagiarism in this class before. And the reason I'm doing this now is to try to um, prevent, I don't want to go through this process. and I do not want to levy any of these penalties on you. So. Um, just be aware of that. Try to cite everything as much as possible. So grading in this course. Now, this is really in reference to those 200 word essays that um, I'm talking about. Um, what I want to say is that, well, every other unit you'll have basically two 200 word essays to write. Each of those will be 10 points. And this is kind of how it's broken up. Two points is, did you completely answer the question or the prompt that I give you? Now, there's some times where I leave it a little bit open and ask you several different questions in the essay prompt. And if you want to like focus on one thing, that's great. I'm, I'm cool with that. Uh, uh, just, just be a little careful with that. Um, it, it should be relatively clear when, when I'm doing that or when I give you that option. Um, then does, uh, half a point will be, does the intro clearly state your thesis, the main point of your, your little essay that you're writing? Um, the bulk of the points though come from, you know, and this is gonna be the bulk of the writing, you know, probably somewhere around 150, if not more of those 200 words are gonna be from the, um, your pieces of evidence and how, do they make sense? Are they good quality? Um, is it a good argument? Then a half a point will be, you know, the conclusion. Does it clearly sum up your info? Does it, um, is it not repetitive? That kind of thing. Then one point, is it free of spelling or grammar errors? Now, if you miss a comma here or there, whatever. But, um, you know, I think with word processors, there's no reason for spelling. Please proofread your stuff so you can get this one point. Okay, so let's uh, move on from that, you know, not so fun stuff. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about me. So uh, real quickly here, we're going to be talking about different approaches to the environment. And one thing I should say is that um, these are pictures of me. I am what I would consider myself a conservationist. I really... Um, like spending time in nature, uh, but I also use nature in a variety of different ways. I'm a fisherman. I like to hunt. Um, I like to, you know, spend time. Uh, one of my favorite things to do with my children are go out and collect wild food that we can eat and bring home to our table. So I like being out in nature, but I'm also going to be using nature somewhat. Uh, one one of the things I really like to do is wildlife photography, and that's a picture I took of a golden eagle that I think is a cool picture. Um, one thing I should say is there will be times in this course where I have a little like red text that says my views, and those are referring to like my own personal beliefs. Uh, you won't be tested on my views. Um, I just want, you know, I just want to have disclaimers every once in a while of, you know, this is what I personally think. So I think that um, solves some problems if people are thinking I'm trying to teach, you know, my own personal beliefs, which I really try not to do that in this course. Uh, one thing, though, that uh, really bothers me um, is the misuse of so much of our natural world. Um, seeing, you know, all of these tiger and leopard skins and uh, rhino horns that are getting used for um, medicines in Asia that don't do anything. That really bothers me. So I do feel very strongly about some of these issues, um, and we'll probably see that come out as we, um, 
as we progress through this course. So I believe that conservation is really, really important. We're, you know, we're not doing a good job of that as humans on this planet. But I also know that our our conservation efforts need to be economically feasible, right? Having this thing on your car is just not going to work, right? This is a dude riding a bicycle so he can toast his bread here with a, some weird toaster. I don't think that is really necessary. Um, but, you know, I know that we'll always have an impact on the environment, but I like this quote here. It's from, you know, some sort of bumper sticker. The environmentalism, the crazy idea that we ought to clean up after ourselves. So I think that is really important. And um, I, I just, I, I want that to be, um, you'll kind of see that come out in, in the themes of this course over, over the, over the, whole course. So um, now let's just jump right into chapter one. Um, you know, it's, it's a nice introduction to how this course will go. So um, I think we should start out by defining what an ecosystem is, okay? An ecosystem is the region in which organisms and the physical environment interact. And much of this course is based kind of on ecosystem concepts of how um, how we as humans are living in an ecosystem, affecting an ecosystem, how that ecosystem affects us, and then how we can um, change our behavior potentially. Or uh, first off, what is our behavior doing to the ecosystem? And then how can we can potentially change that to help that ecosystem or conserve or preserve that ecosystem. Now, the, the tricky thing about an ecosystem is that, you know, it's, it's pretty clear, you know, when we think about a lake ecosystem here, well, what are the organisms in that lake, okay? Well, certainly this walleye, this fish here, and um, there's, a, you know, a little bluegill here, and there's plants and a turtle. Um, and we can think of, we can draw the boundaries of this ecosystem relatively easily. Where it becomes a little bit more tricky is, well, okay, oops, sorry. What about this osprey, this bird that is eating the fish in the lake? It's probably, maybe it's going for this walleye here. Is that part of the ecosystem? Well, it doesn't live in the lake. It might live on this tree over here in a nest, but... Um, it's still interacting with the organisms in this lake. And what if that osprey then flies around? So um, another example of that is, okay, the Great Plains, right? Here's a map of North America, and we see the Great Plains are somewhere in this, this area right here, this polygon, where it's short grass prairie pretty much. Um, maybe not all short, some, let's just say prairie here, okay? Um, that could be the boundaries of our ecosystem. Well, the thing is, these aren't just local issues, right? There's migratory birds that are, you know, breeding up in Canada, flying through the Great Plains here and overwintering down in Louisiana or something. Um, organisms are going to be crossing these barriers, no problem. So then we as humans are changing the environment on a grand scale that's that's much larger than we've ever seen in the past. So things that are happening in this example, things that are happening in California, pollution or um, just anything that's released in the environment in California can potentially blow over and affect things that are happening um, in, in the Great Plains here. And that can be through, you know, through the air, through the water, through organisms that are migrating, all sorts of things. So drawing a, um, a boundary around an ecosystem actually can be relatively difficult. But one thing we do know is that we are interconnected. So I take this picture. This is a picture taken by um, Apollo astronauts, you know, from the moon, basically. And... This picture kind of started, in some senses, 
the um, the environmental movement on in the United States, yes, but across the world. And you know, everybody that's ever lived lived other than the one person that was in the spaceship at this time taking that picture is in that picture, right? So we can see that in some senses, everything that happens on this planet is interconnected and everything that's going on has an effect on something else. We can see that through a food web, right? So the berries are connected to the grasshopper, which impacts the frog, which goes to the snake, which goes to the buzzard, right? So messing up any one thing or fluctuations in population, just maybe natural fluctuations of grasshopper populations will impact the berries, might make the berries increase the number, but frogs will have less food, which then the snake would have less food and the buzzard then would have less food. Um, so all of these things are interconnected with each other. And that doesn't that doesn't stop with humans, right? Humans are connected very much to the environment. Um, we kind of have perceived to have a decline, right? Because we, we kind of think of like indigenous peoples that are, you know, hunting and gathering societies or, you know, all of us a thousand years ago were these people making cave paintings on the walls of caves and going out collecting our food. Um, I think... It's very easy to see how these people are connected to their natural environment. The thing is, we as humans now are just as connected as we were before. It's just the responsibility has shifted. So we no longer just not, you know, most people don't go out and make, collect, hunt their own food, right? It's a few farmers that are um, farming on land or a few ranchers that are um, getting the food now, uh, or getting our meat food for us, right? I think it's easy to see, though, that our choices are connecting us to our environment, and certainly with food, right? Um, the food, the choices we make of what food we choose to buy, what food we choose to eat, certainly impacts our environment, the world environment. But it's not just food, it's things like our clothing, right? So right now I have cotton pants and a cotton shirt on. Um, so that is that is grown somewhere and going to impact, you know, how much fertilizer is needed, how much uh, pesticide is needed, how much just land use is needed to grow my pants and my all of my clothes, right? Um, and I think there's other choices we can make that definitely connect us to our environment, right? Do you have a fuel efficient car? Do you have drive a big truck? Now, I'm not saying driving a big truck is bad, uh, but I, I just part of this course is to get people to realize how your choices are going to affect the environment and how you can, you know, be more informed to make, uh, you know, at least an informed decision in the future. Whether I agree with it or not, you know, I hope to at least just inform you a little bit about some things. And I think these, why I'm talking about choices is these choices are becoming more and more important, right? So before, for the real long time, humans, there weren't that many of us, but in the last thousand years, we've seen this huge increase that right now we're somewhere at like 7.7 .7 billion, I believe. And as our population is growing, we're having a bigger and bigger impact on the environment. So I can show a bunch of sad pictures, right, of uh, how um, humans are affecting the planet. And that's not what this whole course is meant to be, really. But what I do want to make the point is that our... Our choices that we make will have impacts on natural environments. I think um, I'll show this picture several times throughout this this course, but um, you know, I think this picture really goes to show that humans are having a big impact on on the environment. This is a, you know the United States at night, and you can see that we are everywhere, 
right? Across the planet, we are pretty much everywhere. So um, all of us making collective choices will have a huge impact on the planet. All right, so uh, welcome to the course. And um, please, again, let me know if you have any questions or if you're having trouble with anything, accessing material, let me know as soon as possible.